I'm sure you've probably heard of the strikes in Hollywood, and supposedly these strikes are the biggest that Hollywood has ever had in the past 60 years. So this is quite a significant development, really. And I wanted to give a brief outline of what's going on with the strikes before going into the actual impact on Hollywood. But I think it's actually some good news. How do you feel about the whole thing? Because you've been following this, haven't you? Uh, I think this is excellent news because it could lead to the impending collapse of Hollywood and potentially the breakup of one of the largest paedophile rings in history. Oh, you stole my joke. <laughs> there you go. The great minds think alike. Though. Yeah, I think that uh, anything that causes soy boys and redditors to screech about the fact that they might not be able to get their Marvel product on time is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, Hollywood films recently, the mainstream big budget films have been really quite rubbish. They've not been to my taste. Maybe some people have I enjoyed some of them. giving them far too much credit. They have been utter garbage. They have been the worst of the worst. They have been something that's left behind after you flush. <laughs> I think an apt analogy here. But here we have an article from the BBC, and I'm just going to read a little bit from it. It says... Actors will not appear in films or even promote movies during the stoppage. Major films in production, including Avatar and Gladiator sequels, may be affected by the shutdowns. Um, the actors are joining writers who walked out in May, concerns about pay, working conditions, and the in industry's use of artificial intelligence. Brian Cox, not the um, physicist, um, the lead actor of HBO's Succession, told the BBC the strikes could last until the end of the year. The whole streaming thing has shifted the paradigm, the Scottish Star told the BBC newscast. Um, They're trying to freeze us out and beat us into the ground because there's a lot of money to be made in streaming and the desire is not to share it with the writers or the performers. And I think that that's actually the main thing here is that... I want to be made, I want it to be made clear that Brian Cox has identified himself in the past as a socialist. Mm -hmm. So that's something important to note. It is indeed. However, um, I think a lot of the major names who are striking don't necessarily need to do it for the money. I think they are conscious of, yes, there are smaller people than me that are getting screwed over because they are losing work. And I know I'm not going to you know, lament the poor Hollywood elites losing money. Who cares, right? But it does seem like some of them are legitimately participating for the little guy from my digging, at least. Well, potentially, but there are more opportunities for actors than purely within Hollywood. And I would, true, yeah. I would like to see the breakdown of Hollywood, <clears throat> if only because the small actors who go to Hollywood to start their careers, 99% of them are going to fail anyway. Mm -hmm. And the ones that do succeed will have to end up participating in some scummy activities or be predated upon to get to any position where they'll mm -hmm. have power and influence and success within Hollywood. So I think Hollywood in its entirety is an incredibly corrosive um, institution to have within society. So I want the whole thing to crash and burn. I mean, even when you're just talking about it from a pure creativity perspective, what are the two films that this article lists in its first few lines? Avatar and Gladiator sequels. So mm -hmm. Avatar is a film that came out 2009 that became huge for some reason and then went away for 11, 12 years. I think it rode the wave of 3D in cinemas. But then the second one came out and was also hyper successful as far as Callum has told me, but still no one really cares that much as soon as they've finished watching it. And we don't need more Avatar sequels. We don't need more sequels to a film that people don't seem to be able to remember. Mm -hmm. um, and then Gladiator was a film, a good film, that came out, what, 23 years ago? Why do, a while we need, ago yeah. why do we need a sequel for it now? Hollywood is creatively bankrupt. The people in charge of Hollywood are creatively bankrupt. And we need it to collapse so that we can mm -hmm. have something to take its place that will actually foster creativity. Absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree. And I think we are largely in agreement on good films, right, a lot of the time. Yes. We both um, have excellent film taste. Let's pat ourselves on the back, shall we? Always do. <laughs> but I think the, the sort of dynamic here going on is that there's a Pareto distribution of, you know, the, you've got the top people earning really good money, but like 80% of the industry are not on good money and could be earning more. And a lot of the bigwigs in the industry are getting all of this streaming money that they're not sharing fairly. And that's probably the major reason. There are other concerns, as there are with any sort of dispute, really. But Still not going to be shedding out any tears over this. Mm -hmm. It's also worth mentioning as well that Hollywood studios say they offered actors a billion in gains before the strike, and they're still going ahead with it. So it seems like they are quite serious, really. I mean, how was that going to be distributed between everybody? So I know, among it, everybody, there are that might have just been pennies. Mm -hmm. 
that there are logistical questions, but there was at least some sort of concession there and they've still carried on. So it makes me think that they are a bit more serious than merely just looking for a quick money grab. And uh, here we have this. And uh, it's also worth mentioning that Hollywood has not had a good summer. Their yeah. films have flopped. And uh, what, what were the films? We were talking I, about I this off this camera. on the podcast the other day. Mm-hmm. So um, Indiana Jones 5, oh, yes, another course. film that nobody asked for because nobody wants to see literally 80-year-old Harrison Ford being emasculated, breaking his hip. Possibly I've not seen it, so he might, I just assume he's going to break his hip in it. Uh, being emasculated by a younger woman who is going to be taking his place and obviously being set up as some kind of indie replacement because they wanted to do spin-off films with Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character, but even of those who I've seen review the film who enjoyed the film more than they expected, they all said that Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character was awful and nobody <laughs> liked her. The other one being The Flash. Okay. another major box office flop. A lot of people are trying to say that, um, compare them to The Sound of Freedom and say, well, overall, they made more money than The Sound of Freedom did. No, overall, they brought in more money at the box office if you're talking pure gross numbers, which would mean Sound of Freedom took in, last time I checked, I think about $50 million on a $14 million budget, whereas these films took in close to between the 250 to 300 million mark. So if you're talking pure numbers, then yes, they took in more. But if you're talking profit, Sound of Freedom actually made a profit, whereas both of these films are massive losses because you don't just take the production budget and say, well, you just need to make more than that to break even. What you do is you take that, then you double it. And mm-hmm. then possibly if you're talking about these really huge films, maybe even double it and then add a half or even triple it because you're going to be talking about not just the money that's used to make the film, talk about the money that's used to promote the film, uh, for all of the marketing and then the fact that there will be loans taken out with banks to make sure that they can finance the film then you've got to add all the interest on top of that there's a lot of money that goes into these things very much so yeah so it's also worth mentioning as well that many of the strikers have been guilting other actors and actresses to take part as well here is a headline from um, the Daily Mail saying where the F is Ben Affleck because I think he got himself involved but then didn't actually turn up to the strikes themselves too busy defending Islam, I imagine. Probably. But respecting women somewhere. <laughs> no, and women respect to Ben Affleck. <laughs> and um, this is the part that I thought was the most interesting. This is an article from Fox News titled, Actors' Writers' Strike Could Lead to Hollywood's Absolute Collapse If Not Resolved Soon, Former Paramount CEO. And of course, Paramount being one of the major film companies. And the CEO, I think, is someone who's well positioned to understand the lay of the land in Hollywood. And I'm going to read a quote from him that is as follows. What will happen is, if in fact it doesn't get settled until Christmas or so, which by the way, the actors and the writers have said that it may well go on until then, until the end of the year, then next year there's not going to be um, too many programs for anyone to watch. So you're going to see subscriptions get pulled, which is going to reduce the revenue of all these movie companies, television companies, the result of which is that there will be no programs, Dilla said on CBS, Face the Nation on Sunday. um, And it says, and uh, uh, just at the time, um, the strikes uh, is settled. I don't really understand. And at just the time, the strike is settled that you want to get back up, there won't be enough money. So if it does get settled, by the time that they do settle it, everything will have collapsed already. And I have got my fingers crossed because we do not need more Hollywood propaganda Mm -hmm. invading our homes on a day-to-day basis. What we want is for people to either go back to the classics and watch those or, revolutionary idea, go outside, socialize with one another. As far as I'm concerned, Twin Peaks got three series and a movie. The height of cinematic perfection has already been reached. (laughs) We don't need to make anything else now. David Lynch isn't making any more films. I don't care about what. Comes I mean, I like Twin Peaks, but I, I wouldn't quite go that far. I would. <laughs> the only person who I would mi- say maybe we should, you know, give some leeway for would be Robert Eggers. Fair play, good choice. If we can get Northman too, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I need. He doesn't do sequels, thankfully. Yes, thank but God. Here is an article from somebody known as Harry Robinson. You may know him, Harry. Um, Not a fan. No, me neither. He's annoying, isn't he? Mm. Um, but it's titled "Hollywood Does Not Care About Justice," and this is your article talking about the state of Hollywood and provides lots of reasons why you should hate it. So if you want some extra reasons to celebrate its demise, here you are. It's also got an 
audio track so you can listen in, so you don't even need to read. I know many of you don't like reading or can't. Josh can't read, as we found out. Yeah, well, <laughs> it is first thing in the morning. <laughs> I'm still bleary-eyed. So here we go. Um, this one I thought was quite interesting. AI could make movies better, says Hollywood star as thousands of actors stage a walkout. And this is Simon Pegg, um, who I am quite a fan of his work. He does Absolutely. good stuff. And he says, it might be a good thing in that it'll stop us from being mediocre. There is a lot of mediocrity out there sometimes. So if it ups our game because we want to escape the velocity of this creeping threat, then it's a good thing. He and I agree. Point. Yes. He makes an actually good point there, which is, well, all the films we've been making recently are terrible. So if it turns out that AI could literally make better films than we can, maybe we should try harder. <laughs> Revolutionary idea. Yet I know again. it's such, such common sense, but well done, Simon Pegg. I imagine it's probably not made him very popular in Hollywood, but um, I mean, he, well can done always, to him. he can always come back over to Albion, can't he? Yeah, well, he is still insufferably left wing, but on film, he is right. But he is insufferably left wing in English, which means I feel better for, about him than I do with anybody else who works in Hollywood. <laughs> okay. Then. He's made good films that I appreciate. Mm -hmm. Talking of other insufferably left-wing people, here we have um, Mark Ruffalo. He did a little tweet thread talking about this, and he's saying, uh, just to summarize, because it's not really worth reading, because some of it's, it's like, the funny thing is, before I actually talk about the content of it, he's arguing for free market principles in the language of Marxism. Of course, he's. Mark Ruffalo is um, an insufferable progressive. He is, yes. But it seems here he's making a point that I might be able to agree with. Basically, he's saying that we, um, we as in <laughs> actors, not myself, um, need to do more indie films and move away from the big studios because through competition, it's going to encourage better practices overall, which is, um, has he been reading Basic Economic by Thomas Sowell? I don't know. I hope Guys, so. I've just found about this guy called Murray Rothbard. You should check him out. <laughs> but yeah, he actually makes a very good point that you don't actually need to work in Hollywood. Many good films have come outside of Hollywood. So you don't need to do it. And if lots of major names start doing indie films, it's going to become the norm and Hollywood is going to die, which is great. The, some of the better films that I've seen Mark Ruffalo in have been of the more indie variety, like Eternal Sunshine, for instance. That was one of the ones that comes to mind. It is, it is a bit of a chick flick, but it, I did enjoy it. Is it? I'd say maybe. <laughs> it's a bit too, I don't know, uh, sci-fi, weird, high it's concept. It's a bit too interesting to be, to be yeah. a rom-com, yeah. That, that's what I was skirting around saying. <laughs> it's a bit too interesting to be a chick flick. But just to give you some reason to be annoyed, um, at Hollywood, so even more so than you know the, the questionable um, practices towards everyone and the terrible films. Here we have just something that epitomizes everything that is wrong with it. It is this: um, new live-action Snow White dumps seven dwarfs for seven multiracial, mixed-gender magical creatures, and they wonder why they're failing. I know it's ridiculous, isn't it? And I wonder if they have a, a picture of it. No, they don't. Oh, here Wait, we are. There we go. So yes, um, Snow White, who they famously have, called they have as such, one dwarf. I know, famously called as such because her skin was white as snow, has now been cast by a, uh, I think she is part Colombian. Yeah, she looks Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Not known for their pale as snow white skin. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got the hairstyle right, and she is quite a, a good looking lady. But I'm not going to deny that, but she's not Snow White. Yeah, it seems like an unusual casting choice. And for the dwarfs, they've just gone off off piste entirely, haven't they? Well, they've they've got a token dwarf, <laughs> so they're filling the diversity quota in entirely the wrong way. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't dwarves traditional European folklore? Yeah, well, so we could make the claim for cultural appropriation right here. We can indeed. Okay, I'm I also offended. like how one of I the, want reparations. One of the uh, so-called dwarfs looks like he runs an art collective in Portland as well because he's wearing like a beanie and he's got that sort of look about him. You know the one I'm on about, don't you? Yeah, the one third from left. <laughs> third from right, I should say. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that it, it's kind of wrong that they're robbing dwarves of their, their breakout role. You know Shakespearean actors, you know, the, the sort of theatrical people, they like doing things like a fellow, that sort of thing. You know, these are the things that are their bread and butter. Well, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I feel like... I, I mean, okay. If you want to employ 
dwarf actors who, you know, are going to be good actors, then you're going to need to give them dwarf roles. Um, you can also cast them in other roles as well. Mm -hmm. For instance, Peter Dinklage has not just been cast as characters who are identified purely by being dwarves. He was also in that X-Men film as well, mm -hmm. where they made a character from the comic books a dwarf specifically so they could get Peter Dinklage in for it. So you can cast them in all sorts of roles. But realistically, let's be honest here, dwarf actors are going to get cast as a few things. They're going to get cast as dwarves. They're going to get cast maybe as, um, as, uh, as, as uh, goblins. Uh, as small woodland creatures <laughs> and leprechauns, this is what they're going to get cast as. <laughs> All right. You're right, but it sounds terrible. <laughs> it does, that's what Warwick Davis did. He mm. became famous, or at least got into the acting business, because he played one of those little stupid Ewoks, Ewoks yeah. in Star Wars, didn't he? So, okay, you he's a good actor, though. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's alright. Um, <laughs> His best role was in An Idiot Abroad Series 3, where Carl bullied mm. him up a mountain. That was pretty based of Carl, not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but you're stealing people's roles. Mm -hmm. This isn't nice. No, I, I, I don't think it's a, an offensive role for them to play. It's I not mean, demeaning. Sure... It's not like the Seven Dwarfs are negative characters. They're presented as, you know, being fun to be around and, and pleasant, really. They each Maybe have not so their much grumpy, individual yeah. personalities. There's a range of mm. uh, emotions that can be expressed through being one of the seven dwarves. Perhaps it could have been an opportunity to humanise rather than demean, but alas. I mean, Peter Dinklage would appreciate, but then again, he is a fan of pulling up the stepladder behind him. He is indeed, and we are going to talk about him. You Daily could say Mail. some of these actors are being a bit shortchanged. Come on now. <laughs> So this wasn't very big of the producers. This th these pictures of the production did go around, and uh, everyone reported on it, saying it's ridiculous and terrible. Uh, but um, <laughs> other outlets also reported on this fact: conservatives are losing their minds over Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs photo. But it, um, they, I think they've changed the headline here because originally it was to do with the fact that they were fake. They actually said in the headline, "These photos are fake." Disney have said they are fake. Except they're not. They're not, no. Um, and as Fox News reports, Disney backtracks claims that photos of politically correct Snow White movie were fake. And loads of outlets were gloating, just like, look at these silly right-wingers getting annoyed at a film that's not even real, or some screenshots, should I say. And yeah, it was. It was just that Dis Disney denied they were even real to try and get some damage control before walking it back, because how can you deny... A film that is eventually going to come out for all to see if they want to, which they won't. But it's going to be undeniable, isn't it? What, what have been the profitability of the Disney live-action remakes thus far? Because I can't imagine they've been incredible unless they've... Who needs to watch these live-action remakes? Part of the charm is that, you know, they were cartoons. They were fun. Part of... I love the original run of Pixar films mm -hmm. from the first Toy Story to about Toy Story 3. Classics, every mm -hmm. single one of them. Uh, but I do hate what they've done to 2D animation, which is completely sideline it. I think 2D animation is a real art form in itself, mm. and it is a terrible shame that it's been completely sidelined in favor of 3D animation, particularly in the way that Disney used to do 2D animation. I really don't like Pixar things anymore. I mean, I am I've not a bit watched old any of their it, films for a long time. They're insufferable, yeah. But finally, I wanted to point out that, yes, Peter Dinklage, this article was from a year ago, but the... Uh, <laughs> This was when the remake of Snow White was announced, and he was saying it was yeah, I backwards. remember mentioning this on the podcast at the time. Yes, you did. And um, it, it seems a bit unfair. It it's not a bit small-minded of him. Now, now. But yes, I don't understand why all of this weird wokeness. Of course, he's allowed to have an opinion, but I also think that it's not really fair to deny other people the right to make their own creative decisions. But yes, this is... One of the many reasons to dislike Hollywood, this is just the latest one, that they're being silly. I mean, they could have made a live-action remake that was actually good. It is possible to do that. But uh, they haven't. And in fact, they've inserted as much woke nonsense as possible and actually been weirdly discriminatory by trying to be woke. And this is kind of... <laughs> They, they are hammering the final nails in their own coffin. Always here. how it ends up happening, isn't it? You're being racist, but you're doing it for woke causes, so it's mm -hmm. fine. You're being discriminatory, but you're woke, so it's okay. <laughs> Apparently so, but supposedly the, the sort of short of it is that if these strikes continue until the end of the year, Hollywood is in big, big financial trouble 
But even the fact that these are going on in the first place means that other studios are going to start picking up the slack and making some good films. So all around, this is actually some good news. And I hope that these strikes actually carry on until the end of the year. We get rid of this horrible, disgusting thing that is Hollywood. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as the Brokenomics series, this episode on the fourth turning. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.